Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We are ministering on the lines of the new birth. And um, once we're born again, that means once you come into the kingdom of God, then we, we, in the past couple weeks, have made it clear that the new birth is not joining the church. The new birth is not being water baptized. The new birth is not shaking the preacher's hand and joining the church. It's not joining the Sunday school. It's not taking First Communion. It's not being sprinkled, dipped, whatever, dunked, whatever. None of those things save you. It is the confession and acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, believing God raised him from the dead, and receiving in your heart the, the new life imparted to you by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, once you're born again, now, see, I grew up classical Pentecostal, and we kind of had a mindset, if they got anything, they'll be back. All right? And if they really got something, they'll be back. Well, that's like saying, you know, when the baby's born at the hospital, you just leave. They, if they're really my child, they'll show up at my house. All right? You just, you know, they, they can't survive without you. And so the church, is, we, we've missed it on these areas. I'm not telling people once they are born again what that means and what to do with it. You know, you've got to grow. Everybody said we've got to grow. You know, Peter wrote to the church and said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You can't feed a T-bone steak to an infant. Amen. They're not ready for it. They can't even gum it. Amen. Hello. You know, so we, we've got to teach you how to grow. So what we're going to start in this morning, let's talk about here. Look at Romans chapter 4. I mean, chapter 6, verse 4. It says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we. Underline those words, even so we. That's very important. See, a lot of times people get this idea that the Bible just kind of teaches us how to get saved, that we're going to make heaven, and then you're, you're, it's just whatever happens, whatever comes, whatever goes, that's just the plan of God, and it's just going to happen no matter what. But here it says that like Christ, as Christ was, we were buried with him at baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we. That means there's something we're supposed to do. That's something we are supposed to do. Now, I know some of the new mantra in the church today is, you know, because we're under grace, that we, you know, we're automatically going to get this and automatically going to get that, and everything's just going to happen. You know, you can go out and live any way you want to live, and, and all the blessings of God are still going to come on you, and you're just going to walk in all the fullness and all the blessing, even though you're out there living like a dog. That's just not true. Because the word tells us here, it says, even so we also should walk. Yeah. Now, just to help you out a little bit, this is not a suggestion. Hello. Amen. This is not a good thought. In actuality, this is a command. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, people say, oh, there's only one commandment, the commandment of love. Go read your Bible a little bit better and stop listening to Dodo. You need to read your Bible and find out stuff. There are more commandments in the New Testament besides the commandment of love. Yes, it is the highest commandment, but it ain't the only one. Here we are taught that it's just like Jesus was buried and we were raised up with him, and that we are supposed, and, and by, the, by the glory of the Father, we're supposed to walk like he walked. We're to walk in what? Newness of life. That tells me I can't keep living the way I used to live before I got saved. Come on now. I can't live the way I did before I got saved if I'm going to obey and do what this, word, this scripture right here says. Just like God raised Jesus from the dead by his glory, even so we should also. What, what's, what's the, who's the other one that we're walking like or also like? Jesus. Yeah. Our life is to be patterned after Jesus. Yeah. Well, you can't walk like Jesus. He's God. No. But we're to pattern it. Yeah. Right. Right. We're not to go... I just, whatever I do, he's going to bless me anyway. No, we're supposed to imitate him. Be imitators of God as what? Dear children. Christ is our example. Ever say, Jesus is my example. And we're to walk in newness of life. There's a life that's been imparted into you. Say, the life of God has been imparted into me. And because of that, I'm to walk in newness of life. You're not to walk the way you used to walk. That, that, we're going to get to that today, but I'm going to tell you something. Sin hath no more dominion over you. Now, when we get to there, we're going to talk, we'll talk about it again, but I'm going to give you a forerunner on it. If you were with us a few weeks ago on, uh, on our teaching on the life and writings of Paul, when we, when we were in Romans 6, we started talking about how sin did not mean, you know, going out and doing something. It was a nature of sin or the dominion of sin. 
And see, before you were born again, you were under the dominion of sin, the authority of sin. Your spirit, man, was bound to obey the dominion of sin. But see, since we're in the newness of life and we got the life of God in us, the dominion of sin has been broken and we are no longer debtors. We're no longer bound to obey the realm of the kingdom of darkness because we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And now on the inside of us, there is a newness of life. It is the life of God. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus working in us. And out of that we are to live, glory to God. See, people who want to fornicate and commit adultery and live in homosexuality and steal and cheat and say, I'm under the grace of God, are letting the old man dominate them. They're putting themselves under the dominion of sin and saying, I'm going to live here, but I want to go to heaven. And we're not supposed to live there. We're supposed to live in newness of life, glory to God, where God's life comes out of us. And we're imitating Jesus. What did Jesus do when sin showed up? It is written. It is written. He would not bind himself to the works of darkness. He defeated them with the word of God. Can you say glory to God? Hallelujah. Praise God. Go with me if you will now. We're over here. So here we are. Walk in newness of life. Hold your place in Romans 6. We're coming back. Okay? We're not, we're not going to leave there for long. We're going to come back here. But go over, if you, will, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. These are letters to the churches. Now, the new mantra among, among people who don't want to live right, I don't know what else to say, is Jesus didn't say anything about it. <clears throat> now, just for the, if you missed that service where I said this before, or if you weren't here when I said that, if you were on the internet and you didn't hear what I talked about this, Jesus' ministry was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. These were people well-versed in the law of God. Understanding that, he didn't have to address everything. They knew the moral code of God. He didn't have to come and say that you, don't, you, know, you can't live in homosexuality, you can't commit adultery, you can't fornicate. He didn't have to say all that because they already do all that. Amen. He's talking to an educated people in the moral code. Not only the moral code, but all the law of God, but I want to talk about the moral code right now because that's what everybody keeps wanting to do. They want to drink. They want to get drunk. They want to shoot up. They want to smoke dope. They want to live in, se in sexual liberties. They want to do all kinds of things because Jesus didn't say anything about it. Well, the apostle Paul by the Holy Ghost did. Hello? Why? Because he was dealing with Gentiles. And they were living ways that the Jews knew they couldn't live. And so he said a lot of things. Just because Jesus didn't say it. And actually Jesus confirmed all that when he said this. Think not that I've come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. What did he say? The law is the law. It's still what God demands. Now, we'll get to this eventually today, or I might get to it right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, the law had dictates and demands that you couldn't live up to. The Jews couldn't live up to it. And so Jesus came as the answer to their inability to live up to the commands and dictates and law of God. Hallelujah. Here in Colossians chapter 3, I mean chapter 1, verse uh, 13 says, who delivered us from the power, that word is exousia in the Greek. It's not dunamis, it's not talking about the might of darkness, it's the authority. He came and he delivered us from the authority of darkness and has translated us or transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. What did he do? He transferred us from one authority or one dominion to another. See, we've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness, or we've been translated out of the power, from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Meaning this, we're no longer under the dominion of a nature of sin. We are under the dominion of the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is the one we're under the dominion of. Meaning this, that the newness of life in us enables us to do what the law told us to do. 
the moral code of God, the spiritual code of God, the things that God demanded of unrighteous men to be able to be in his presence was unable to be accomplished by the flesh, but by the transference of dominions, by the transference of allegiance, by the transference of our spirits from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son, we now are empowered by the grace of God, not unmerited favor, but strengthening grace, empowering grace to live the way God said live. Hallelujah. We're not bound to obey the flesh and its demands. To say or to tell people they can do that, you're simply bringing them down to the lowest common denominator of human existence and re recapturing them and rebinding them under a system that they're no longer bound to. Amen. Hallelujah. Colossians, I mean, Galatians chapter 2. Man, we could just leave right now and go home and say, Whoa, glory to God, I had a good one. Anybody got blessed yet? Well, I don't know about you. I done blessed myself, got happy. Now, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Well, let's back, let's back up here just to um, verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto Christ. That I might live in the gospel. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, let's say it. There's people like laws, like rules and ordinances. Do you know why people like rules and ordinances? Because then they can figure out what they can get away with. And there's a lot of people who want to live under, well, thou shalt not, because they can go, well, he didn't say anything about this, so I can go do this. Right. But see, the life of God in you wants you to walk in a different place. Right. The life of God in you draws you into another place. Right. Hallelujah. You know, one scripture says, and I, I, um, I didn't write it down, I should have wrote it down. It says this, that Christ is the end of the law. Now, bear me out for just a minute here while I, while I teach you this. Remember, Abraham was what? Before the law. And he pleased God by walking what? By faith. The Bible says in, in Romans, Romans chapter 4, look over there. Back up. Just a couple of chapters here. Verse 22. And therefore, it was imputed. I'm sorry, 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. What is that? That's faith. When you're persuaded that what God promises you, he's able to perform, that's walking by faith. Verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. The word imputed is the same Greek word translated, accounted. It was put to his account as righteousness. Why? He could not be made righteous until Jesus came, but he had the account of it being. It was imputed to him or accounted to him as righteousness. His faith was until Jesus came and he could be made righteous. All right, so we have Abraham walking along here doing this. The Bible says 400 years after the promise, the law came. Why did the law came? Because of the sinfulness of man. Man became exceedingly sinful. They just kept, they weren't walking by faith. They weren't, they were, and so God brought the law, and according to the word of God, the Bible says over in, oh, Galatians. Help me out somebody, Galatians 3, 4, Galatians yeah, it, it, that um, the law was given as our schoolmaster. Somebody know what that is right off? I had it before church and I didn't write it down. Should have wrote it down. 320, there you go. I knew it was 3 and 4. There you go. Thank you. Wherefore the law, oh, see, verse 22, 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which we should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And then there's another scripture that says Christ is the end of the law. Now, so what we have here, I wish I had a marker board this morning. We have here, we have Abraham walking along, walking by faith. 400 years after the promise is given, man becomes sinful, so the law is given. It's a, it's a, it's a diversion. The law is given to prove to every man you can't live the way God wants you to live. Yeah, Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law to, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And so we have these, these centuries of under the law, under the law, under the law, no one ever able to achieve righteousness by obeying the law. What was the law to do? It was to show you what God demanded to be in his presence. 
and that you were incapable of achieving that place on your own. So the law is a schoolmaster. And we come along with the law, the law, the law, the law. And the law points us what? Keeps going over. And the ordinances and the sacrifices and the daily in the temple. And all the things going on. Proving over and over and over and over again that without God you are sinful. But he didn't leave us there. Oh, glory to God. He did not leave us there. He, he said, you're sinful. You can't do this. You can't come into my presence doing this. And you can't be in my presence doing this. And know that, or this, or that. 3,000 ordinances, or 30,000, one of them, whatever. It's a bunch of them. There's more than 10. But it all was to point to one thing. What? Genesis 3.15. For the seed of the woman will bruise your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. The promise of the coming of the one to whom all the law was pointing to. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. But there's one coming. Woo, glory to God. God promised from the very beginning there's one coming. Hallelujah. He's going to, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bust your head, boy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The law kept saying over and over, century after century, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, year after year after year after year, you can't live up to the commands and the dictates of a holy God. Amen. Pointing to what? Christ, who was the end of the law. Yeah. Meaning what? All those things God still demanded to be in his presence, but you could never achieve them on your own. Christ came. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus came. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Get out of Galatians, Ed. Oh, glory. Where is it? Over in, I'm sorry, it's Colossians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Blotting out, verse 14. Blotting out, verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, stop. Law says you're dead. The law says you're in the uncircumcision of your flesh. The law said sin has dominion over you. You can't please the holy God. You, could, you can't even go into the temple. You can't get into the holy of holies. Only the high priest once every year, and that with the blood of the people and his, for his own sin to put on the mercy seat of God. You weren't permitted into that chamber. You can't get into his presence anymore. You're dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. But he didn't leave us there. Oh, my. See, a lot of preachers leave us there. We got to go, see, we got we to tell people where they are and tell them how to get where they need to be. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then when they get where they need to be, we need to know how to live with what we got. Yeah. Come on now. Hallelujah. He says, you who were dead in the trespasses of, 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 of your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened. Old King James, from made alive with him, having forgiven you your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Here's the next one. And having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them open. He made a show of them. I'm sorry. Yep. Made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Now he's become the end of the law. You cannot, you can no longer. Now let me see this. People get all messed up. They go read about the law in the, in the, in the New Testament. And they, they think, you know, if you come along and say, now you're supposed not to be fornicating. You're, you're putting us under the law. No, I'm not. I'm telling you, live out of the newness of life that's in Christ Jesus. I'm not, I'm not going to put you back under the Old Testament law and say, you've got to obey Leviticus this and Leviticus that. We've got to do this. We've we got to go to the temple and we've got to make the sacrifices. That's what Paul was talking about when he was talking about the law. He's not talking about the new laws that we walk in as born-again creatures. Hello. Now, Christ has become the end of all of that. 
and where you could come along anywhere in any of those ordinances, in any of those commands, in any of those rituals, in any of those ordinances that you, you were supposed to obey, if you follow that line, you come to one thing, you come to Christ. But the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to find to bring us to the ineptness of our ability and the complete utter uh, degradation of our being and bring us to a place where we can't do it but through him and be identified with him and coming into the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus, we are now able to do everything the law demands. Hallelujah. I say glory to God. By Jesus Christ on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Then that brings us over to Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Therefore, I mean, what? <laughs> there is therefore, thank you. There is therefore. Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit for the law. Oh, glory be to God. See, Christ is the end of the do's and don'ts, and there's a new law in Christ. He's the end of all of that. Glory to God. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I no longer have to obey and be bound by sin. I'm now free by the life of God on the inside of me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Paul tells the church, it's a new law working in us. This is what upsets me about some of this grace teaching that people are doing. They're telling people it's okay to fornicate. It's okay to commit adultery. It's all right. We accept and affirm your homosexuality. We do all this stuff. And that's not living out of what God told us to live out of. That's telling us let the flesh rule us. And Paul writes back in Romans chapter 6. Not to yield our members as servants of unrighteousness, but as servants of righteousness. Oh, glory to God. We serve a holy God. And because of the newness of life, we can walk with boldness into his presence as a child of God. Why? Because who, if therefore if any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. One translation says, a new species of being that never existed before. Glory to God. <clears throat> what is that being? He's a new creation. He is the man of the second birth that Jesus talked to Nicodemus about. And that man can walk in to the presence of God. Not as Romans 3 says, with our righteousness being as filthy rags. For they have been stripped from us. Hallelujah. And just like the prodigal son when he came home, had a robe put on his back and a ring on his finger, and the fatted calf was killed, and that which was lost is now found, and there's rejoicing glory to God. When you got born again, God stripped the robes of unrighteousness off of you and clothed you in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and said, you're welcome in my presence once again. Glory to God. And now, we're in time past where Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. That what I wanted to do, I can't do, and do what I do, I don't really didn't want to do. And he goes back and forth and back and forth, talking about one of two things. One, either the unregenerated man who wanted to serve God, or the regenerated man who didn't know how to serve God. And I really believe it's, it's the latter. Somebody who's born again but doesn't know how to serve God, so his flesh is still dominating him. And a lot of this grace teaching is, is allowing people to be dominated by their flesh. And telling them how to, telling them how to get out of it. God doesn't want you fornicating. Well, one guy told one of my ministers that I'm, I have in my Raymond Ministry Association, him and a girl came in for, for couple counseling. Talked to him about five minutes, figured out, I, I know what your problem is. They said, what? Y'all living together and you're not married. They said, oh, that's all right, Pastor. We're under grace. It don't matter. He said, you're in the wrong church. See, they heard some teaching from somebody on the Internet, on television. You know, somebody gave them a book or something. You don't reign in Christ Jesus living by your flesh. We are to reign in Christ Jesus by living out of the man on the inside who's born of God, filled with his spirit, filled with the word of God. Hallelujah. Where that newness of life comes out. We take the old man off. We put on the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus and righteousness and true holiness. Over in Ephesians. Remember that? Take, put off the old man and put on the new, which after, God is, or after Christ is created in righteousness and true holiness. Y'all hear you go home. That's the man we're to live out of. 
And anything less will cause you to be um, down, depressed, beaten up. Because on the inside of you is a man saying, let me loose. Let me loose. Turn me loose. Follow after me. Let me follow after God. Hallelujah. Are you here? They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. God does not lead you into sin. God doesn't accept and affirm your sin. God's still a holy God. He said, be holy even as I am holy. People leave those, you know, it's amazing how many scriptures people leave out of the Bible when they don't want to deal with it. Oh, well, I read the first half of Galatians and Paul said all kinds. Yeah, he did. Go read the last half. Paul consistently would set up who we are in Christ, our position in Christ, and he would come back and talk about how to live that. <clears throat> if you just read the stuff the way you are, what you got, and don't read the stuff how to do it, you'll get a skewed or a warped sense of what he's trying to say. Hallelujah. We're born of God. Say, I'm born of God. Hallelujah. Let me get, let me get back over here. Don't want to leave anything out. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> and so he nailed all our handwriting of ordinances against us, nailed it to his cross. Now let's go, let's go back to Romans 6. Because some of you weren't here when we talked about this out of Romans 6 on our Wednesday night teaching. We're on Romans chapter 11 or 12 now. Hallelujah. Look at verse 5. We just remember, we're walking through this life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death. See, when you came to Christ, everybody that comes to Christ identifies with being buried with him. Everybody identifies with being buried with him. If we've been planted together in the likeness of his death. We should also be in his resurrection or the likeness of his resurrection. We're the, we're not, not only are we to identify with Christ in his death, that means our sin being judged, we're to identify with him in his resurrection. Now, does Christ fornicate? No. no. Does Christ commit sin? No. Does Christ live after the flesh? No. Then we're to walk like him. Amen. Amen. But how can I do that? We just told you. There's a new life on the inside of you. Stop letting your flesh dominate you and stop looking for people to tell you it's okay to do what you know is not right. People will do that. I've gotten phone calls from people. Want me to okay their sin. Now, I've told this story before, but you know, one girl called me up one day. She started telling me about the God showed her she was going to marry this man in the church, you know, and I lied, went on and on and kept telling me how wonderful he was. And I, so I started asking questions. Number one, I said, why are you calling me and not your pastor? Well, I can't talk to my pastor about this. Do -do 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 Sirens going off. You know something's up there. So I kept, you know, kept poking around a little bit. Finally, I got her to confess that what the problem was. I was like, have y'all you, talked? Y'all gone out? Y'all like, no, 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 no. Why? Well, he's married. And I'll be honest with you, before I thought about it, before I could stop it, it came out of my mouth. You had too much pizza last night. That's an indigestion dream you had. Because God didn't tell you that. That's why she's calling around. She's looking for someone to condone her sin. Stop looking for that. You should be looking for places and ways of the Word of God and out of ministry that empowers you to live above sin and quash and steal the appetites of the flesh and to make it be submitted, as Romans 12 says, that we're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is our spiritual service, and walk with Jesus. And walk like Jesus and be like Jesus. The law of love is not, it does not operate in the realm of okay for sin. We've got that so messed up. See, everybody wants to take the law of love and put it on this side of the cross instead of on the other side of the cross. The law of love was your what? Remember, we just went through the whole thing. All the commands, dictates, ordinances, and, and, obe and things you had to obey in the law to get to God. But God so loved the world, 
He knew they couldn't do it. So he gave his love, gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why? So that he could become the end of the law and that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. What? You come into Christ and now you are free. You are able to do the demands of the law. That God loved man so much, he sent Jesus, his only son, to die so that he could become, uh, we could be born of him and come into the kingdom of God and come into the body of Christ and now that life that was in him is now in us Amen. and we're able to live above it and so God's love made a way where we can satisfy the claims of the law by faith and live the way God designed for us to live by faith so we have so y'all thought I forgot this Abraham coming along here, the detour of the law to Christ, and now we go back up, and it's the plane of faith. We now are walking in the faith of our father Abraham in obedience to God, unable to, to, still unable to do what the, the law says by the flesh, but the new law, the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, the law of, you know, that's in us, now empowers us to come back up. We're now back on the plane where Abraham was. We're off that detour now. Why? Because Christ is the end, and now he's raised us up. And remember this. God promised, made God's promises to Abraham and his seed, not the seeds as of many, but the seed as of one, which is Christ. Now we're in Christ, and now we walk out the plan, the promises of God in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And if you sin, now this is some bozo that are teaching that, that 1 John 1, 9 doesn't belong to us. No. Now that we're, in, it's because it's with Christ, the seed, and we're in Christ. If we sin, we have an advocate. Hallelujah. I don't go back under the law of sin and death and I'm and penalized by the law of sin and death. I can now have an advocate and go, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I keep walking in that plane of the realm of faith. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Hallelujah. It, did, now, it doesn't mean that God still demands we don't fornicate and we don't live in adultery and we don't steal and we don't do all this and we don't do that and we don't do that. It doesn't, it's, that's not that that's been done away with. That was just put in a, in, a, in a law to show you what you had to be able to do to please him or to be walk in his presence. And because you're incapable of it in your own power and your own ability, Christ became the end of the law. Now he elevates us back up to the realm of faith, and we walk by faith and not by sight. And the righteousness we have now is faith righteousness. And then, man, if we mess up somewhere here, we go to him, and he goes and puts his blood back on us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sin. Hallelujah. Now we're walking in a different plane. We're not walking under thou shalt not. Now, let me say, Jesus talked about sin. Paul talked about sin. Paul, I mean, people say, Paul, the Bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality. That's the, that's the hottest newest thing in the church right now. Everybody's trying to figure out what to do about it. Just do what the Bible says. Men left the natural use of the woman and burned the lust one to another, working that which is unseemly. That was not a compliment. That was not a Okay. Likewise, women were also caught up in that same dissimulation and burdened less one more towards another. That's not that lesbianism isn't okay. Right. Now, now the new terminology is Paul didn't address a monogamous, committed relationship between same-sex couples. Because there's no such thing. God doesn't ordain marriage. Hello. It's a man and a woman. That's just the way it is. But those same people they're living in that kind of sin, and the people who are living in adultery, and the people who are living in, in, all, in anything else still have the command of the law, but their answer is still the same. The end of it is in Christ. And he elevates you up. No matter how you've been living, if you'll come to Christ. And listen, and there's churches out there deceiving people. This is why the truth must be told. When we, when we pervert the word of God, we, we, we are... In, we are damning the souls of people to hell because the answer they need, you hid from them. You don't think people like that are going to face God's judgment worse than others. You're wrong. Because Jesus said it's worse for you to be having a millstone tied around your neck and dropped into the sea than to offend one of the little ones. When you deliberately lead people astray, God's not happy. 
Hello. God's moral code is still the same. But the answer is always the same. The end is Christ. Amen. Now, let's get over here in Romans chapter 6. Anybody got blessed yet? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, verse 9, 6. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth should not serve sin. Now, let me say this. When you see in this chapter the word sin, not sins, sin, is referring to the nature of sin. And the nature of sin is the one that is dominated by Satan's authority. Okay? So we're, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we know henceforth should not serve Satan's dominion. The dominion of the kingdom of darkness. Remember Colossians said that we've been, that we've been delivered from the power or the authority, exosia, the authority of darkness and translated, transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. Now it's saying the same thing Paul's saying here. Remember he wrote Galatians and Colossians after he wrote Romans. And so he's already established the premise. And so he just ties on and uses different terminology. He's talking about the same thing. Being delivered from the authority of darkness. You have been translated out of that or transferred to the kingdom of his dear son. You are now free from the dominion of sin. We should not serve sin. Verse 7. That for he that is dead is free from sin. That old man is dead. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Knowing that Christ no more die, uh, being raised from the dead dieth, no more death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise. Everybody say likewise. Underline it. Stop letting tradition and dumb dumbness rob you of revelation from the word of God. Amen. Yeah, but Jesus, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. He said likewise. In the exact same way that Jesus dieth no more, and death or, or the kingdom of darkness hath no dominion over him. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. What are you saying? I am dead to the authority of Satan's rule. My spirit no longer is in obedience to the law of death, of sin and death. My spirit no longer has to obey. My spirit is free. And what? It's alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Same thing he said over in Colossians. And having been delivered from the power, the exorcia of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son, saying the same thing, just in a different terminology. My spirit man is alive unto God. And now when sin comes, Whereas before you were born again or before you had revelation, one of the two, E.W. Kenyon makes a very interesting statement back in his writings. He said this. He said, a Christian who does not renew their mind to the word of God will imitate a sinner. Yet the word of God tells us to imitate God. Why? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul in Romans chapter 7 tells us, man, when you, if, you don't, if you don't understand who you are in Christ, you want to do right, but your body's just doing wrong. And when you try to do wrong, uh, but then when it wants to do wrong, you want to do right. And there's a battle going on. But the moment you have a revelation of who you are in Christ, that death hath no more dominion over you, Satan hath no more authority to make you do. Now, we all remember Geraldine, the alter ego of Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it, honey. Yeah, before you got saved, he could, but not now. Amen. I said, not now. He shows up now. You can say, oh, wait a second. There's a new law working in me today. Hallelujah. You used to be my master. You used to tell me what to do. You used to call and pull me by the nose and drag me all over the place and make me live in sin. And I was obedient unto sin. But I want you to know that I've got a new master today. Glory to God. And on the inside of me is a law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. And he's given me authority over you. Glory to God. And I'm telling you, no. I will not obey my, my body and the lust thereof. I will obey God. Amen. Live according to his commandments and his ordinances and please him. And the grace of God. This is why, this is why I think the, 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 the definition unmerited favor, undeserved unmerited favor is just not good enough. Because when you take it in context, remember when Paul said when he was given the thorn in the flesh? 
He said, I'll rejoice in my infirmities because when I'm weak, then am I strong? He said, I'll rejoice at the power of Christ. So the grace of God, not to put up with it, but the grace, the strengthening grace that comes into you. And you stand up like the Apostle John said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you look sin, you look troubles, you look tribulations, you look everything straight in the face and you say the greater one's on the inside of me. The strengthening grace of God comes on you. You've expended all you know how to do in the natural. You've taken everything you know to do in your ability. You've taken it to the very end. Hallelujah. But when you get to the very end, the strengthening grace, I rejoice in my weaknesses and my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Not to put up with it, hallelujah, but to win. Now, that Paul came to the conclusion near the end of, uh, of, of 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, or 1 Corinthians, I forget now, chapter 15, and he says this, now thanks be unto God. Which always, ooh, glory to God. Make you run. Make a Pentecost out of a Baptist. Oh, figure that. Make a Pentecost out of a Presbyterian. Hallelujah. Make them shout and run. Now thanks be unto God which always causes me to do what? Triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh my. Oh my. Before I couldn't obey. Before I couldn't do. Before I didn't have the strength. Before I didn't know what to do. Before I had a desire but I, I wanted to honor God but I couldn't honor God. But now you're in Christ Jesus. But now you are children of God. But now on the inside. Glory to God now on the inside. When the enemy comes, hallelujah, there's a man on the inside that rises up by the grace, by the strengthening grace of God and says, I'm a born again believer. The life of God's in me. I'm blood washed, blood bought, blood kept. Glory to God. I'm a winner. And you can't make me and I'm not going to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All because we came to the end of the law and we came to Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And now that you're under grace, you're no longer under the law. I now live a different way. <coughs> It doesn't mean you throw out the Old Testament. Because he still has things he says, and then you can go, like, oh, yeah, he says, don't do this. Well, <laughs> I cannot do that. Because God's life's on the inside of me. Then we don't have to offer sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus is entered in once and for all. Remember that? Rome, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. For the blood of good bulls and goats and the sprinkling ashes of a heifer, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Year. After year, after year, after year, they just kept collecting. And they just kept, they kept getting pushed back each year. Kept getting higher and getting pushed back. For the blood of bulls and goats and the, sanct and, uh, and the sprinkling of the ashes of the heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more? Oh, my. He didn't just eliminate that. He didn't just eliminate the sin Shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience? Ooh. Remember every year they came, they still remembered all the stuff they did. It just got kept and pushed off. But how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit purge your conscience from dead works? What's dead works? All the stuff that's in that, that got forgiven that you shouldn't be doing. He's purged your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Oh, my. So what does that tell me? All the stuff the law said I shouldn't be doing, I don't get to keep doing it under grace. No, the grace of God has empowered me to live in a way that serves and pleases God. Because those are all dead works. I've been purged your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I'm purged of those things. 
Well, you just know I've always been like this. No, when you got saved, you no longer can say I've been like this always. Yeah. Yeah. Why? There's a new man on the inside. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. I should have had at least three hankies out today. Somebody should have been waving a hanky. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore. And we can say therefore. We can just take therefore and put it back at the beginning of the verse. Therefore, don't let sin. Yeah. Same thing. Let, sin, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as, as those that are alive, uh, I mean, sorry, that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of unrighteousness, of righteousness, I'm sorry, uh, unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, Paul immediately addresses the dodos. What then shall we sin that we are under, not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Now here's, but let's, let's leave that because you know, I just want to say that all that stuff that people teach, it's all right to live in sin. You can do this. You can do that. You know, da 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 because you're under grace. People coming out going, I've had, I mean, some of the stupidest stuff I've heard people say. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit because I'm under grace. Amen. Aren't you glad they were sitting there? They would have gotten sprayed. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, because we're not under the law. We're under grace. We're to be submitted and obedient to God and the beautiful the wonderful the glorious thing is we're empowered to hallelujah that new man has power so we feed him the word we're led by the spirit the greater one on the inside of us we reach the place that we don't have strength just look to the greater one. Let him rise up. We don't submit and crumble. And, you know, now listen, let me say this. If you are allowing sin, every time it comes to your door, knocks on your door, to enter in and take control of you, you're living in an abusive relationship. That went over big. Just like a woman who's married to an abusive husband. And she leaves him. And he comes back. And every time he comes back, she crumbles. And then he goes and beats her again. Let me just come and tell you. Satan going to beat you again. That's an abusive relationship. And God has set you free from his dominion. He don't have the right. You just need to be like, uh, uh, I think it was Sandra Bullock in Enough. Jennifer Lopez, that's right, Jennifer Lopez. I, can, I get it mixed up sometimes. Jennifer Lopez. You know, she had an abusive husband, kept beating him. She went and got trained on how to defeat him. He walked in and she beat the snot out of him because she learned all these self-defense techniques. And, of course, in the news, she kills him. And then throws him over, the, over into the river and he just drifts away with weights on him or something. And so that's what we have to do with the devil. We have to get trained so we can end that relationship. And when he shows up and try, and when you, your flesh wants to cower and obey, you pop him in the nose and break his nose. You punch him in the ch throat and collapse his throat. Amen. Knee him in the lower regions, bend him over double. And then take his head and drive it into your knee. Hello. Amen. You've got to see what happens. Now you have the authority. You're the upper hand. And that control he once had over you, he no longer has. And same with that abusive relationship, that same thing with Christ. Now you're in Christ. When Satan shows up, you can break, pop by me. You can break them all to pieces in the name of Jesus. Just everything you do in the name of Jesus. The word says this and the word says that. And you kick him down the road and tell him, I'm no longer, your, your, I'm no longer under your dominion. Your control of me is broken. Why? Because Christ is the end of the law. And out of that place, we're elevated out of a realm where we, we're in the law of sin and death, and we walk into the realm of the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Man, it's good to live there. That's where we need to be living. That's how life, let me say something, sickness has no authority there. Poverty has no authority there. 
Disease has no authority there. Sin has no authority there. And as long as you exercise your rights and privileges and authority in Christ Jesus, you walk above it. So don't yield yourselves. Don't buy into. You know, our churches, listen, the church is not the soul saving station. The church is the development and discipling of the believers. We're to go out and win them and bring them in and get them discipled. One of the biggest churches in America, their, their mantra is this. If you're coming here to be discipled, you've come to the wrong place. That's not what we're about. Then you're not about the kingdom business. Well, we got a lot of people saved. I'm not sure. I question if you're, are you just appeasing the flesh and making people feel comfortable and happy about their, about their flesh and that they, God affirms and accepts him. Or why aren't you discipling? Because you're in a disobedience to the master. Go and make disciples of all men. He didn't even say go make converts. He said go make disciples of all men. We need to teach people. You need to know how to live free from the authority of Satan. I'm not tell you it's okay to live under his kingdom and still make heaven. I'm going to give you one last one. Just the, it's all over the country now. It's going all over the country. Brewing hymns or beer and hymns. They're having beer and hymns night in churches. Yeah. Oh, beer and hymns. Come in. We, have, we, we, we drink some brew. Sing some hymns. Everybody's happy. You were trying to think outside the box. You thought way outside the box. I mean, yeah, you're outside the book. That's right. You might be out of the box. You're out of the book too. Beer and hymns. Atlanta, Greensboro has it now. Atlanta, Charlotte, San Diego, San Francisco, all at Tulsa. Tulsa has it all over the country. Beer and hymns. Everybody's trying to find a way to get people into their churches other than the right way. And people are flocking because it appeases something in their conscious subconsciousness that they're all right with God. But in reality, they're being told a lie. Jesus did not say go into all the world and give them some mad dog 2020 and sing the 115th Psalm. Some of you old folks, some of you folks know what Mad Dog 2020 is. Some of you folks forgot about it because you were so drunk you didn't remember when we had Mad Dog 2020. Who knows what Mad Dog 2020 is? Mogan David, MD, MD 2020. It's old cheap, that's like Richard's Wild Irish Rose Wine, cheap drunk. That's a, they, they call it Mad Dog because it made you like a mad dog. We don't, we're, we're to get people to live out of that new man. I'm, my brother and sister, I want you to know today that when, when you leave here, what I gave you this morning empowers you to face Satan straight on. And tell them, no, I ain't living that way. No, you don't have authority over me. No, I'm not going to live according to your dictates anymore. I'm going to live out of the new man. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Hallelujah. And Dr. King took one of the old spirituals and made it his mantra for the civil rights movement. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And just like God wants to set and liberate and being in the natural from oppressiveness and evil and evil workings, even more than that, he wants man's spirit free so that man spiritually can say, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. I'm free from the bondage of sin. I'm free from the dictates of sin. I'm free from the, the lust of the flesh. I'm free from those things to serve the living God. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. 
thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.